Ferreira and instead become its custodian. Let's channel funds towards securing the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities and shift trillions towards supporting sustainable jobs. So that protecting our forests is not only the right course of action to tackle climate change, but the right course for a, a more prosperous future for us all. Two Metropolitan Police officers have pleaded guilty to misconduct in public office after they shared images of the bodies of two murdered women. PC Dennis Jaffer and PC Jamie Lewis took photos of the murdered sisters Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman on WhatsApp while they were protecting a police cordon. While speaking outside the Old Bailey, Mina Smallman was asked if she thought Met Commissioner Dame Cresta Dick should resign. Yeah. And, you know, whenever I, I was in a senior position, I, if my organisation or department failed, it was on me. It was on me. I had to take the can for it. Well, it's now time for them to take the can for it. Insulate Britain protesters have now been removed from three separate sites after staging demonstrations in major cities outside of London for the first time today. Around 60 activists disrupted traffic in Manchester, Birmingham and also London. It's the eighth consecutive week now that they've held demonstrations. Nine protesters have also been told they'll face committal proceedings over the breaking of injunctions that have been granted to national highways. The Environment Secretary George Eustace says that a British scallop trawler has now been released after being held by French authorities. Well, it comes after France backed down in a dispute over French vessels fishing in British waters. The French president warned they could block British boats from its ports from today if they fail to issue more licences to French fishermen. Speaking to GB News, the Environment Secretary said any action by France would have been a breach of the Brexit agreement. Those threats to you know, deliberately create border disruption and prevent UK vessels going into French ports would have been a breach of the agreement we've got with the European Union and probably would have breached elements of EU law as well. They only have to demonstrate that they've got a track record of working, you know, at least one day, um, one day a year over a four-year period of accessing our waters. The vast majority have been able to demonstrate that with the records that they have. The price of fuel has gone up by 27% over the last year. An average litre of petrol now costs 143.7 pence. That's 30 pence more than November last year. And it's the highest price ever recorded. This means it now costs around £17 more to fill up a typical family car. The increase in fuel prices has been driven by the cost of oil doubling in the past year. Some MPs are calling for the rollout of smart motorways to be suspended because of safety concerns. The scheme, which uses a hard shoulder as a permanent traffic lane, has been criticised by the Commons Transport Select Committee. Well, concerns were raised after multiple incidents involving fatalities where broken down vehicles were hit by other drivers from behind. Yesterday, demonstrators protested against smart motorways by marching to the Houses of Parliament. The supermarket Morrisons have apologised following complaints over one of their food labels. Some customers on social media accused Morrisons labelling of being anti-EU, referencing this chicken crown sold by the supermarket. Well, it describes its ingredients as containing non-EU salt and pepper. We reached out to Morrisons and they said their label is adhering to British packaging regulations and they'll be redesigning it as it was, quote, not political commentary. You are right up to date here on GB News. I'll bring you the latest headlines in half an hour. Now, back to Liam and Gloria. Coming up on De Piero and Halligan today, later in the show, we'll de be debating the issue of online GP surgeries. And we'll be asking, should they be scrapped? This comes after a survey found patients and doctors concerned over telephone and video consultations. As ever, it's not just our guests we want to hear from. We're convinced that you have personal testimony on this, so please do join the debate with your view. Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Now, are you finding it difficult to get a face-to-face -face appointment with your GP or even an appointment at all? <laughs> Perhaps you've been offered a remote appointment instead. Around 40% of doctors' appointments in England in September were done over the phone or online. 
That's according to research conducted by NHS Dig Digital. And before the pandemic, it was just 20% of GP appointments were online. Research published today has found patients and doctors are concerned about these remote appointments. That's right. The University of Cambridge questioned more than 1,000 rheumatology patients as well as doctors and hospital clinicians. Whilst most participants found video consultations convenient, many were worried about the accuracy of assessments made remotely. Now, our first guest is Lisa King, who tragically lost her husband Peter during the coronavirus restrictions last year. Lisa, we're most grateful to you for joining us here on GB News. Just tell us what happened in the case of your departed late husband. Um, hello. This was July last year. Um, Peter had had pains in his stomach um, and they gradually got worse over a short period of time. I emailed the surgery, as I always had done, uh, uh, requesting that he had a face-to-face -face appointment. I was quite specific where the pain was in his stomach. I told them how serious I thought it was and, um, and that he needed a face-to-face -face appointment. They came back and said, um, on this occasion, um, we will um, telephone and speak to your husband um, but next time he has to book an appointment via the online consultation. The GP did phone. Uh, Peter could not tell him how severe the pain was. He couldn't express it, how bad it was, and where it was, because the GP couldn't see where it was. He told him his stomach was bloated um, and he was in pain. The GP, um, he spoke to the GP. He told him, I cannot express how bad this pain is to you. The GP was a bit terse towards him and he, Peter said, you do know about my uh, underlying health condition. He had genetic hemochromatosis. He said, no, no, that doesn't matter. I haven't got your records here anyway. I think you've got acid reflux. I'll send a prescription to your pharmacy. Um, if nothing changes in a week's time, just come back to me. Um, so Peter took the medication that he was prescribed. Um, there was no change. He still had the pain. Um, six days later, he um, was in terrible pain. He was screaming. I, ca I can't describe the screaming that he was uh, going through. He was violently sick. I called an ambulance. They came. Um, they did all the tests, everything else was fine. As the um, uh, paramedic went to touch his stomach, he flinched and she said, right, come on, you've got to go straight to hospital. They took him to hospital and he was discovered he had a problem with his gallbladder. Um, he, had, he was in so much pain, he was on morphine. Um, and he had CT scan, MRI scan, and they discovered that a stone had lodged in his bile duct. Um, so he was in hospital, but they couldn't operate on him because um, of the delay in going from the GP to the hospital. He had a severe uh, infection. Peritonitis had built up. Um, and they couldn't remove his gallbladder. They got the stone from his bile duct and they sent him home and they said because of his uh, underlying health condition, his uh, genetic hemochromatosis, um, he's a priority, it has to be done. And they said in four to six weeks it would be done. However, the hospital did say that the delay in going to hospital because of only seeing the GP remotely, um, it caused an infection. Um, and he was sent home at the beginning of September. He had a, a pre-op assessment. And they said that he was going to have his gallbladder out because of his other condition he had. Four weeks later, a gall stone had moved again to his bile duct. The, um, the surgeon iron in his heart. So I couldn't 
kid anymore. And he had a heart attack and died. I'm sorry, it's that was... breaking to, to listen to, to you, Lisa. You're doing so well at explaining yeah, yeah. what has happened to what happened to Peter and the impact that that has had on you clearly. And anybody who will be listening to you cannot feel anything like the pain that you are suffering. But it's incredibly hard to listen to to, to your to what's happened. May I, may I ask you, Lisa? You said that the GP said on that occasion, when you tried to book the appointment as you normally did, the GP said that on that occasion it had to be remote. Was there any explanation about why on that particular occasion, just so we can try and work out what's going on? Pandemic. They said because of the pandemic, they weren't seeing patients face to face. Um, they were following government guidelines. Um, I, it didn't make sense to me because they could have still seen patients face to face and had a, a system where as one patient came out, another one went in. So there was no interaction. It, there was no reason to stop um, face to face appointments, in my opinion, because the frontline doctors and nurses were still seeing people face to face. They had to. They dealt with them. But why GPs removed, moved straight over? is a mystery and one that ministers and health professionals need to think clearly about why they decided that there and then and to acknowledge the um, heartache and the devastation that that caused because what happened to Peter has happened to many others, unfortunately, and families like ours Lost, lost someone prematurely, and they have to make take account of that. I know they have come out with this nine point uh, basis for GPs now to see patients face to face, but it's just too late. It's just too late. Lisa, you're you're doing incredibly well, and and you're an extremely brave person and I'm sure Peter would be proud of you. I just want to ask you one final question. How do you feel when we're told to clap for the NHS? How do you feel when you're told that our health service, which of course contains many excellent professionals doing a good job, how do you feel when we're told that our health service is the best in the world? It's not the best in the world. Not anymore. It was once, not anymore. Underfunding for decades has destroyed that. And it will never be the same. I mean, I can't bring Peter back. Nothing I can do can bring him back. But I just hope anyone who's watching this or listens to it will realise that it has to stop. And I think it has now. Um, they have to see patients face to face. You cannot remotely diagnose you cannot and like i said before the devastation it, it, I, I, no words i can't put it into words the, the loss not just to me but to our two sons as well it's just it's just unacceptable that they did this and unacceptable as well that Unions are wanting to uh, poll their doctors about striking. No, enough, enough. See your patients face to face. Stop families being destroyed like mine has and do your job. And as for clapping for NHS workers, frontline doctors and nurses have done an in a fantastic hard job during the pandemic. There is no doubt about that. But GPs, not all. But some took it upon themselves to use this as a way of doing less. And the consequences are Peter. Lisa King talking there on behalf of herself, her family and her late husband, Peter King. Thank you. Well, the Department of Health and Social Care have provided us with a statement. They say this is a terribly sad case and our deepest sympathies go to Mrs King 
as well as all those who have been affected by the uncertainty and challenges of the pandemic, we are clear that GPs should offer both face-to-face -face and remote appointments and NHS England wrote to practices in July reiterating this expectation to further ensure consistently high levels of care. Now, our next guest is Dr. Mohamed Khaki, who's a GP in North London. Dr. Khaki, thank you so much for joining us here on GB News. Uh, I don't know if you heard that interview beforehand um, that we just conducted with Lisa King, describing the case of her late husband, Peter King. Of course, there's a place for e consultation. Of course, for some people in some circumstances, renewing prescriptions and so on, e-consultation can work well. But is it right now that before the pandemic, 80% of GP appointments were face-to-face, -face, but now on the NHS's own data, it's still, even though lockdown restrictions have been lifted, close to 50%? Well, um, I don't know if it's a question of right or not. Thank you for having, having me back again. It's great to be back. And I, I would say to start that, it's absolutely heartbreaking to hear Lisa's story um, and um, losing Peter. You can see how distraught she is, of course. And I think our, all, all of our hearts go out to her. And I you know, just wanted to send our condolences, really. I think one of the things to say is that we're in a really difficult situation because when we moved to more e-consultations, more telephone consultations, that was something imposed upon GP. It wasn't something that GP said, well, I think we'll just stop seeing patients. It was because patients were coming in with COVID because at that time in the pandemic, that meant that GP surgeries, GPs, nurses, everyone within the building was then getting COVID or having to isolate and they were closing surgeries. It meant that actually now we had to move that way. Otherwise, there'd be no GP services at all. Having done that and listening to what you said at the beginning, um, you, 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 you know, the, the research, as you said, said the majority of patients, majority of patients prefer e consultation, telephone consultation. So there's clearly not just a, a change that's happened because of the pandemic, but something that a lot of patients are, are actually finding beneficial. It fits around their childcare, it fits around their work, it fits around not having to come in. However, of course, one of the things is that we still lose a lot of information. We lose a lot of um, our diagnostic skills and abilities through not being able to see people face to face. And I think this is where it's really important that we start to strike the balance. Um, we always would love to see our patients face to face because we can glean so much from the way that patients talk, the way they are dressed the way they respond to answers and we can do certain things we can check a skin tag we can do a blood pressure check we can do things that are opportunistic but again we are still in the midst of a pandemic unfortunately and covid levels are still rising and of course a lot of patients are preferring telephones so we're trying to find that balance and i think that's where we need to work harder to, to really as a whole healthcare system um uh, achieve that balance um just going on personal experience, because I've tried to see a GP lately. It's not for anything urgent, I have to say. Um, but I've only been offered a remote consultation. Actually, I probably could do with a blood pressure check because of a side effect of um, possible side effect of something um, that I'm taking. But I, I haven't been offered that. As I say, my case is not urgent. I'm relatively young. Um, can you give advice to people who are told, well, you're only offered a remote appointment. And, you know, we know that's happening because it's happening to me. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not unusual. I've had two GPs, different GPs in the last um, couple of months and the, um, the same thing has happened. Do I have any rights to say, actually, I really think I should have a blood pressure check? Um, can, can you squeeze me in? I, I sort of did suggest that, to be honest. And they said, oh, ring back at some point. Um, so well, it wasn't very helpful. I, I, think to, I, think, I think it's really important. That, I mean, it's a really good question. And I, I think it's really important that we, we focus on how we can be constructive here, exactly as you are. So I think one of the things to remember is that it, it took us a long time to become GPs. It wasn't that we just did it overnight. We spent a lot of time learning medicine, qualifying, going through lots of training. So when we assess 
patients and, and know about the medication and all of the holistic picture, generally, we're, we're quite good at it. And it means that when we do those assessments, we generally know which client, which patients need to come in, which patients need to be assessed, who needs to come in, who needs certain things. Now, if you are on a medication, for example, that needs a blood pressure check, we may call you in and normally it will be an, a nurse appointment to, to have that blood pressure check. But if it's something that someone says, you know, I just like to know what my blood pressure is, or I just like to know my, you know, how I'm doing, but there's no clinical cause. Well, unfortunately, the NHS isn't in a position at the moment where we can, we can have people treated for things they just w wanted to know about because it's not a private service. And if, it, if we did that, then we would, we, we would find it very hard to get people in who have health issues because uh, non-urgent things that are in. But also, we might end up bankrupting the NHS because someone might say, well, do you know, what? I, I'd love to just know like, what an MRI of my head was like. Um, so I think what we tend to do is we tend to do a really good triage. And how it works in our surgery is we'll do lots of telephone calls. And actually, as you know, and as you may have seen, our numbers in terms of people we're speaking to and patients we're in contact with, something like 60 to 70 a day, and something like more than a million since April per month, GPs are seeing and speaking. So there's a lot of increase. And that's come down to us being able to speak to patients on the phone, do a good telephone triage, and then make an assessment whether that person needs to come in. Now, in, in the case of Peter, of course, it's heartbreaking that we weren't able to get that process sped up and, and seen to. But on the whole, a lot of patients who do need to come in are being brought in, examined, and then if we need to start a medication or if we then need to escalate, we're able to do that. Um, so that's how we're managing things at the moment. And of course, as it's still quite a fluid situation, we've got to see. But of course, if you are someone who says, well, look, I'd love to know what my blood pressure is, for example, pharmacies in the, in the, in the community are great. We can go pick up a, a blood pressure machine, have it with you for life now, and check your blood pressure regularly. Um, pharmacists themselves can do that. So there are also other services apart from your GP that you can get things done and checked, and that can really help to support your own health journey, but also to alleviate the burden on GPs so they can see more patients who are urgently uh, needing care. Dr. Mohamed Kaki, a GP in North London, will continue with this debate in future episodes of Gloria and Liam, we thank you for your time. We're grateful you've appeared on GB News. Remember, we want to hear from you. Are you struggling to get a GP appointment? Are you only being offered uh, a remote appointment, if an appointment at all? Should online medical appointments be scrapped? Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet us at gbnews. Later in the programme, we're dedicating time to hear those views, so do send in your emails and we'll read some of them out. Up next... The mother of two sisters murdered in a London park has called on the Metropolitan Police Commissioner to resign. Our Home Affairs and Security Editor Mark White is at the Old Bailey with all the details. That's after the weather. Hello again. Plenty of bright blue skies today. Sunny spells for many, especially inland. There will be further showers, however, particularly near the coast. And it will feel cold in the wind and chilly overnight with a touch of frost in places. Low pressure is still close by. It's to the north of the UK and we're dragging in this colder northwesterly airflow. But the isobars less tightly packed compared to Monday. And so less blustery, less unsettled on the whole. And for many, it's a fine, bright day with plenty of sunshine. Showers inland, I think, particularly for the mid Midlands, southern and southeast England, perhaps northeast England as well. Showers fairly few and far between. They'll mostly be appearing into northern and western coastal areas. And in that blustery breeze, it will feel on the cool side, 9 to 13 Celsius typically. Under clear skies then, temperatures fall away overnight, a touch of frost forming in places. But further showers will feed into northern and western coasts and some more prolonged rain at times for northeast Scotland and then that's sinking south into Aberdeenshire on a brisk breeze. Frost free in the north with that breeze, but otherwise temperatures dipping to one to three Celsius typically inland, perhaps minus one in some sheltered spots. So chilly starts to Wednesday, frost first thing, a few fog patches for the Midlands, southern and southeast England. Soon enough though, this area of cloud and some 
fairly prolonged showers pushes through parts of eastern England, reaching East Anglia by the afternoon. That brisk breeze in the North Sea will feel cold and it will be breezy in the west with further showers here. But inland, a central slice of the UK seeing a lot more dry and bright weather with some sunshine. The showers continue to topple south across East Anglia into southeast England on Wednesday evening. Eventually, most of the showers die away, still some for West Wales, Devon, Cornwall, Northern Scotland, but another frosty night in store and a chilly start once again on Thursday. Cloudier skies appear on Friday, turning unsettled in the northwest. Join me, Alex Phillips, for the afternoon agenda on GB News, Monday to Thursday from 4 p.m. till 6 p.m. We don't lecture to you or try to tell you what to think. We do a deep delve into a topic with views from across the range of debate, therefore leaving you, the viewer, to make up your own mind. Join me, Alex Phillips, for the afternoon agenda on GB News, 4 till 6, Monday to Thursday. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8pm weekdays on GB News. Join us for Political Correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is Political Correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. Hi, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. And we're hosting a show right here on GB News. 9.30 a.m. till 12 p.m. Every single weekday, call to the point. We're going to be talking about all the big issues that matter to you at home in Britain. Absolutely, whether it's holding politicians to account, discussing what's taking place in the channel, banging on about law and order, we're not afraid to do the absolute lot of it. Yes, and if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we'll be saying it. Make sure you're here 9.30 a.m. till 12 p.m. every single weekday, right here on GB News. Four to the point. Welcome back. The mother of murdered sisters, Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman, has called on the Met Commissioner to resign. Mina Smallman was reacting to the news that two police officers had pleaded guilty to taking selfies next to the bodies of her murdered daughters when they should have been guarding the scene. Mark joins us now. Mark, talk us through the latest developments, please. Well, this was an appalling breach of trust. This was at the murder scene, of course, uh, the murder of Biba Henry and Nicole Smallman in June of last year. They've been out celebrating Biba's birthday in Fryant Country Park in northwest London, also celebrating the partial lifting of the COVID-19 lockdown at that time. And they were stabbed to death by Daniel Hussein, who you'll remember last week was sentenced to life in prison for that crime. Uh, today we've had two police officers who should have been guarding the crime scene who have today pleaded guilty to taking selfies off the women's bodies, posting those selfies on the WhatsApp messaging group to uh, friends of theirs, including some police officers and some civilians. Uh, those to one a former police officer, Dennis Jaffer, and his colleague, PC Jamie Lewis, will face sentencing uh, in December for this crime. As they left court, they were released on bail today. We tried to speak to them. I tried uh, to get an apology. The most I got uh, was a nod of the head. Let's take a look at uh, the reaction as they left the Old Bailey. 
What have you got to say to the family? Can you tell us why you did it? Do you apologise to the family? You do. Would you like to say it vocally? Well, of course, the latest incident involving Metropolitan Police officers, another shameful episode, obviously, uh, as far as the Metropolitan Police is concerned, has been reeling from a series of recent incidents and pile pressure on the Metropolitan Police Commissioner Cressida Dick, who has faced a number of calls for her resignation. Well, today that call came from Mina Smallman, the mother of the two murdered women, who said that normally she would not advocate calling for someone's head to go, for them to resign. She would rather that they stay in office, but because of the way in which the Metropolitan Police conducted itself throughout this whole episode, she now believes that it is time for the Metropolitan Police Commissioner to be accountable. This is what she told me and other reporters on the steps of the court. I've always said keep her in a position, get her to do the job. You don't want someone coming in, going from the very beginning and saying, well, nothing's happened yet because I've had to reflect on pre previous practice. However, her shoddy way of behaving and her responses since all of this has come out, you'll remember she came out about the selfies and said, if this is true, then it is appalling. Well, she knows it's true. She hasn't gone on camera. She hasn't contacted us to say, I'm really sorry. She has not spoken into this story at all. And it's shameful. And this is referring to the missing persons. It's shameful that the IOPC had to tell the Met that they should apologize to us for in their failings of the missing persons. Too little. Well, Mina Smallman there uh, went on to say uh, that uh, she believed that it was time for those in a position of responsibility, including the Met Commissioner, uh, to carry the can in this instance. Now, uh, Cressida Dick has issued a statement, uh, the Metropolitan Police uh, issuing that statement about an hour ago, and in that, the Commissioner says, what well, former PC Jaffer and PC Lewis chose to do that day was utterly unprofessional, disrespectful and deeply insensitive. I know that it is the view of colleagues across the Met who utterly condemn this behaviour and she goes on to say they have pleaded guilty today to a serious criminal offence and sentencing will follow in due course. I apologise to Biba and Nicole's family in June last year and on behalf of the Met I apologise again today, not addressing though directly the call from Mina Smallman with regard uh, to her uh, carrying the can and effectively uh, stepping down. Thank you, Mark. Mark White there, GB News Home Affairs and Security Editor outside the Old Bailey. After the break, it's all about your opinion. We'll be hearing your view on whether online medical appointments should be scrapped. Join the debate on De Piero and Halligan. First, let's get the news headlines with Rosie. Thanks, Gloria. Let's get you up to date. Ending and reversing deforestation by 2030. That is the promise of 105 countries at the climate conference. It could help to protect 85% of the world's forests. Boris Johnson says the pledge is humanity's chance to change nature from its conqueror to its custodian. Two Metropolitan Police officers have pleaded guilty to misconduct in public office after they shared images of the bodies of two murdered women. PC Dennis Jaffa and PC Jamie Lewis took photos of murdered sisters Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman on WhatsApp while they were protecting a police cordon. Insulate Britain protesters have now been removed from three separate sites after staging demonstrations in major cities outside of the capital for the first time today. Around 60 activists disrupting traffic in Manchester, Birmingham and in London. It is now the eighth consecutive week they've held demonstrations. 
Supermarket Morrisons have apologised following complaints over one of their food labels. Some customers on social media accused the supermarket of some of its labelling being anti-EU, referencing this chicken crown sold by the supermarket that described its ingredients as containing non-EU salt and pepper. Well, we've reached out to Morrisons. They said their label is adhering to British packaging regulations and they'll be redesigning it as it was, quote, not political commentary. I'll have a full update for you at three o'clock on all the main stories. But now back to Liam and Gloria. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Join us for the Political Correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is the Political Correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. Hi, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. And we're hosting a show right here on GB News. 9.30 a.m. till 12 p.m. Every single weekday. Call to the point. We're going to be talking about all the big issues that matter to you at home in Britain. Absolutely. Whether it's holding politicians to account, discussing what's taking place in the channel, banging on about law and order, we're not afraid to do the absolute lot of it. Yes, and if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we'll be saying it. Make sure you're here 9.30 a.m. till 12 p.m. every single weekday right here on GB News. Four to the point. We're returning to our main discussion point today. Should online medical appointments be scrapped? Can they be useful in some circumstances? Or is it just more sensible to see people face to face? We're asking because a new study has found that phone and video consultations with doctors are considered worse but more convenient than face to face appointments. Indeed, researchers at the University of Cambridge found that medics and patients feel that with remote consultations, it's harder, quotes, to build a trusting relationship. Joining us on the show now is a GP at the same day doctor service, Dr. Lawrence Gurlis. Welcome back to De Pera and Halligan, Dr. Gurlis. What do you make of this research? Isn't it just stating the obvious? It states what I feel. I far prefer to see patients face to face. But I've always been on about the NHS using new technology. I mean, for example, they still use fax machines in many hospitals, and I have to have a fax machine so I can fax prescriptions and, and letters. So I think we should embrace technology, but use it properly. And I think video technology can be used to screen people out, but not to, to send people away, which is what's been happening uh, over the last few months. Um, it's just a case of using it properly. Every day I'm getting patients who are requesting video consultations, and we often say to them, no, you need to come in. If you want antibiotics, if you think you've got a chest infection, we want to examine you, whereas patients think they can phone up and get something quickly and, and easily. So I think from, it, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. Um, used properly, the technology can be a very good screening tool. You can do a lot of administration. You can do repeat prescriptions for regular patients, a lot of paperwork, insurance forms. Uh, GPs do a lot of housing letters and that sort of thing that doesn't require an examination. but. For most other things, I prefer patients to come in. You know, I've heard stories, uh, well, I know from first-hand experience, patients having five online consultations 
Um, and then when the patient eventually came in, he was so ill, he had to be sent to hospital. Well, it should ring an alarm bell after the first one or two video consultations. That patient needs to be examined. So it's up to the doctors to use the technology that's available, but to use it properly, in my opinion. I think that sounds very reasonable. It's those <clears throat> that want a face-to-face -face appointment that can't get one. That is the issue. The NHS says GP practices must, I quote, respect preferences for face-to-face -face care unless there are good clinical reasons to the contrary. I don't think that's happening. Please, please prove me wrong. If it... Yeah. I, I think you're right, Gloria. I think that uh, elderly people who have trouble with technology, I think people want a face-to-face. -face. It's, it's reasonable to give that to them. What's happened is that over the pandemic, a lot of GP receptionists have found a way of really um, putting up a barrier between the practice and the patients. I'm not actually blaming the doctors as much as the reception staff. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it, if a person describes in some, in briefly why they want to see a doctor, I think it's reasonable for them to have a face-to-face -face consultation. The trouble is demand has gone up. The pandemic has made people acutely aware of their health, and uh, the, the GPs have not been prepared or able to deal with this volume of work. But I think the time has now come to open up the surgeries and see people face to face if, if that's what they want. Prior to the pandemic, Dr. Gerlis, 80% of um, GP appointments were face to face, with 20%, of course. Uh, e-consultations. Of course, there's a place for e-consultations if it's yeah. a simple, a simple, you know, prescription renewal or, or whatever. It yeah. works for some people, but now it's yeah. near a 50% of face-to-face -face, uh, only, rather than 80%. Even though COVID restrictions have been almost entirely lifted, shouldn't we get back to where it was before, around 80%, around four in five consultations being face-to-face, -face, with one in five roughly being over the phone uh, when necessary? The irony is here, Liam, and I'm glad you raised that. Prior to the pandemic, there, were, there was pressure on GPs to use the technology more. Famously, Matt Hancock had one of these commercial apps on his phone, and he was a great advocate of it. And GPs were being asked to use the technology, and many of them were resistant. That's the irony here, because they were a bit Luddite about the new technology. Then along comes the pandemic, and they suddenly saw this way of decreasing the time they spend face-to-face -face and, and decreasing their contact with patients. And so they've over-embraced it. They've gone from one extreme to the other, and, and neither position was tenable. Um, I actually think that you can screen people out one of my complaints about primary care, which includes GPs, 111, and people going to act in emergency, is there isn't a clear pathway for patients. Um, and th this idea that people have to phone the GP at eight in the morning and get in a queue and hope they can get the point in that day, it's all nonsense. I would like a very clear pathway. And maybe that pathway is you start with a video consultation. The doctor very quickly says, yes, you've got to come in. They have plenty of face-to-face -face appointments available. Um, and for those that just need something that's admin, then it's done by video. And that would be my preference. One of my colleagues did a session in general practice recently, and she had 15 phone consultations booked, but she was told she can only bring, to bring in two of those patients. Well, that's clearly a nonsense because the very first patient needs to come in anyway. That left her one appointment for the next 14. So I, I just think that GPs need to, to rethink this. There has been a change now at the, the BMA, which I hope will improve the way they, they address this situation. And you're right, let's get back to seeing more people face to face. You said that, uh, Dr. Lawrence, that if the doctor in that initial consultation says, actually, you need to come in, and the doctor should make that yeah. assessment, yeah. but what about if the patient says, I need mm. to come in? Mm. Why, why is it the doctor who should make well, that calculation? Yeah, no, I think that's reasonable. I, I, I think I, if a patient if I, in that situation says, I need to come in, and I, oh, I would say, well, can you tell me exactly why? If they say, well, I've got a form that needs to be signed, or... Um, I just need a repeat prescription. I think that's a, a, a situation where a doctor said, well, you know, you could just pop that in the post and we'll deal with it. But I think, Gloria, I think that's, you're right. If a patient really feels that, that they need to come in, 
then I think it's got to the stage now that we should trust their judgment. As I said, my experience at the moment is that many patients don't want to come in. They like the convenience and speed. If they can get um, antibiotics or in many cases, you know, powerful drugs like sleeping pills uh, without coming in, they prefer to do it that way. But for example, with sleep problems, you really need to have a discussion with someone and possibly a face-to-face -face discussion about the, the merits and demerits of taking powerful medication. So uh, you're absolutely right. I think if a patient feels that their condition requires them to come in, the doctor probably should, should do that. And I prefer to see patients just looking at the way they walk, looking at the color of their skin, looking at their general behavior. And there's also this situation that many patients come in with one problem but on the way out of the door, they say, oh, by the way, you know, I've got a lump in my breast or uh, I'm concerned about my intestines, you know, symptoms of bowel cancer. And that transaction often only takes place as part of a face to face consultation, which is more reassuring and opens up a dialogue in a way that a video consultation cannot do. Dr. Lawrence Gurlis, a GP at Same Day Doctor. Good to have you on the show as ever. And joining us now is the behavioural psychologist, Joe Hemmings. Thank you for your patience, Joe. Don't you think it makes people anxious if they really want to see their GP and a receptionist says that they can't? Oh, uh, yeah. The receptionist has always been at that front line, hasn't she? Or he sort of putting off patients. That's always seems to have been the case. I think what patients want more than anything else is consistency of care familiarity uh, with their medical history and the reassurance that they'll be seen in a timely manner. I mean, those three things are most important. Uh, no reception should ever put somebody off. Some people would prefer, younger people, I think, probably prefer to have uh, online appointments. Older people, perhaps they prefer the tradition of seeing their doctors face to face. But I think it's a hybrid way of working that we have to adapt to, that GPs and patients have to adapt to. But there shouldn't be any barriers to seeing a doctor face to face. Uh, and a doctor needs, I think it's that consistency of care. So if you see someone online, that you know, you're familiar with them, you, you've seen their medical history, that will give you a much greater instinct to invite them to come in and have a face to face than perhaps if you're seeing many different GPs as part of a much bigger practice on an irregular basis, which is, I think, where the online system doesn't work so well for people and does create anxiety. Uh, the government have said that they're going to publish league tables, so you'll be able to, to see which practices offer GP face-to-face -face appointments and which others don't. I'm just wondering if that's going to be accur ac accurately mm. uh, r reflect uh, GP's choices, because the Demographics in that area, the age profile, as you suggest, that is going to skew the data, isn't it? In some areas, mm. with younger, with a younger, you know, pr um, uh, population, they may opt for those for those remote consultations, yeah. but they'll get named and shamed for doing so. Mm. Well, that's right. I don't like the idea of these league tables because I feel they are sort of outing doctors in a way. I mean, they're sort of blaming doctors. Actually, what we want, yes, it does give a patient some choice to see how well their surgery is doing in terms of the balance of face-to-face -face versus online. But the truth is, I do, you know, having a league table where people are starting, as you say, it's different demographics. People might want to leave because the balance isn't right for them. This can get very overly complicated. I think we have to trust our GP practices that, as I say, it's the familiarity, the consistency, the, the, the knowledge of medical history. These are all the things that count whether they're face-to-face -face or whether they're Online, online's probably here to stay. And as I say, some people prefer it. And for certain conditions, uh, or as your earlier doctor was saying, signing off various things, repeat prescriptions, that's a waste, really, of face-to-face -face time when GPs could be seeing other people who need it more. Joe, I mean, as a behavioural psychologist, try and describe to us how it must feel we just heard a really moving interview, an important interview, I think, with Lisa King, um, uh, the wife of Peter King, who died 
because he was trying to see uh, a GP face to face. He had a complication with his gallbladder. Lisa feels strongly uh, that her husband died because he couldn't see uh, his GP face to face. The psychological torment of that must be enormous. That is enormous, and I, I didn't see that interview, but I'm really sorry to hear it. I think that's something, you know, GPs have to use their their common sense and their instinct and know when somebody needs to be seen face to face face to face should be the preferable one and again as your doctor earlier was saying if someone requests to see someone face to face you know you have to listen to it you cannot have a series of online consultations that would uh imply this condition is not going away it's not getting better the treatment that they've been given isn't correct so, i mean we, we must never be in a system where people feel or go through that sort of tragedy or feel dismissed because we have embraced technology. You know, I do it as a psychologist all the time on Zoom. Would I prefer to see people face to face? Yes, I would. And if someone says to me, I need to see you face to face, I will do everything in my power to do it. Some do, some don't. But we've got to have a hybrid, effective working system so that people feel well cared for and less anxious. Could you give us some tips as a psychologist for somebody who calls their GP and feels actually that they are being fobbed off and they really would like to see that GP face to face, but they're really only being offered a remote consultation. Can you give those people some battling tips, if you like, <laughs> to, to stand your ground? Yes, I mean, it's a shame it should have to be a battleground, really. But I think you need to say, look, this is important to me. This has been going on for a while. This is causing me considerable pain. I can't sleep. I can't eat. Whatever it is. I mean, you need, if necessary, you shouldn't have to, but if necessary, justify the reason why you want to see someone face to face. Because uh, it's not just about being fogged off. Sometimes people need to have something seen in person. They don't want to show it. It might be quite private for example, on a video call. So I think if it's receptionists that are causing that barrier, um, then I think they have to be trained to listen to those patients who request a face-to-face -face without making them feel guilty um, or cumbersome that they've asked for that appointment. So I think do stand your ground. Don't think you have to justify it, but definitely explain why you want it. You used an important word there, Joe. I think guilty. A lot of particularly older people, they do feel, oh, well, I don't want to be a burden on the health service. I know I'm always saying to my mum, go and see the doctor. She says, oh, I don't want to bother the doctor. There are other people more important than me. There, is, there are quite a lot of people do feel that way about the NHS, don't they? They do. And look, we, we've, we've heard all the stories about how um, overwhelmed the NHS is at the moment. And I do think, particularly for elderly people, they think, oh, it'll go away. Or I don't really, as you say, want to bother somebody uh, with something. And I don't ever want to get to a system in GP practice where people feel that they're being a nuisance. Um, because those are the very people sometimes who, who really do need to be seen. So again, I think a better relationship perhaps with the receptionist or a triage nurse uh, or a pharmacist, somebody who, who is familiar with you, who, who knows that when you need to see a doctor. I mean, it's really, really important. And yes, elderly people are always going to be like that. So their kids, their friends, their relatives do need to be urging them that they're not a burden. The NHS is there for them when they're feeling poorly. And and they, and they must go and see them before something may escalate and get worse. Joe Hemmings, we've got to leave it there. Behavioural psychologist, thanks for joining us on GB News. I think now we can cut to the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who's speaking 35, not the even 26 summit. Use of, of gas. How is it possible to do this? How, it's, it's through technology. It's through the Promethean power of human invention. That is what is enabling us to make uh, the progress that we are. And I want to see here from uh, the Glasgow breakthroughs a, a new surge of initiatives to deal with some of the outstanding problems. And let me give you one in particular, and that is aviation. And it's a tough nut to crack. And uh, we're spending, I think I can see Bill Gates dimly over there. I, got Bill, I can see Bill Gates. Now, Bill and I, just, thank you, Bill and I just agreed uh, jointly to spend, I think, £400 million trying to solve 
the problems of, of low carbon aviation, zero uh, guilt free uh, aviation. And we've got to fix it. I'm, I'm going to be flying in a, uh, a plane quite soon uh, that has, I think, 35% sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, I mean, and the, ta the target at the moment is to get to 10% to sustainable aviation fuel for the whole world by 2030. How pathetic is that? We can do better than that, folks. It was 100 years ago that, uh, our, uh, that uh, all cock and brown, I think it was all cock and brown, uh, flew the Atlantic for the first time, didn't they, uh, with about 865 imperial gallons of, of petrol. We've made virtually no progress technologically since then uh, in our approach to, to, to sending a plane up over, the, uh, up over the Atlantic. I want to see ALOC. I want to see, never mind Alcock, I want to see Alloc as the, as, the, as the skipper of the next Jet Zero uh, plane that, will, that will, will not rely on fossil fuels at all. And I think that we should, we should be far, far more ambitious. And uh, I just want to say thank you to His, His Royal Highness, uh, the, the Duke of Cambridge, because I think the Earth Shot Prize is a terrific initiative. And I've just met some young people who've got plans for getting rid of, uh, for, of, 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 there's a machine over there about the size of a microwave. It looks suspiciously like a microwave, actually. <laughs> that it apparently can make very cheap hydrogen. Isn't that fantastic? I, I, I believe it. I'm a taker. She, she gave me her card. Uh, it, this, this, could be the, this could be the future. I think that we can crack these problems. And uh, there are basically uh, five key areas where we want to see the breakthroughs take place. They're in, they're in transport, they're in steel, they're in hydrogen, they're in agriculture, and above all, they're in power generation. And we can fix it. Go back to that initial statistic that I began with. Uh, we can do extraordinary things. You may not think that the weather is particularly beautiful here in the UK. Actually, it's wonderful, isn't it? The weather's not too bad today. It's been fantastic. It hasn't been quite up to Kenyan standards, but it's been pretty, pretty sunny today. And th there are many days in which, uh, thanks to our combination of solar and wind, we produce more than 50% of our energy from uh, renewables. What we want, the whole objective of this summit now, is to take these inventions, take these breakthroughs, and get the finance, get the support to make sure that they are disseminated, they are spread around the whole world, so that the whole world shares in the Glasgow breakthroughs and shares in our agenda, and that we unite across the whole planet to tackle, with, to tackle, with, uh, to tackle climate change. And there's one guy who particularly understands how to do that and who shares that agenda and who understands that a single hour, a single hour of sunshine provides enough energy to power the whole earth for a year. You know that, to power all human activity on earth, I should say, for, for a year. One, the, the one man who understands that so well and who's achieved absolutely extraordinary things uh, in his own country of India is the Prime Minister of India, of India and uh, ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, there is one sun, one world, one grid, one Narendra Modi and I give, have great pleasure in handing over to Narendra. Over to you. Excellencies, Namaskar. Aaj, one sun, one world, one greed. Is ke launch par aap sabhi ka swagat hai. One sun, one world, one greed ki meri kai saalo purani karikar parikarpana ko. Aaj, इंटरनेशनल सोलर अलायंस और यूके के ग्रीन ग्रीड इनिशिएटिव के पहल से एक ठोस रूप मिला है एक्सलेंसीज इंडस्ट्रियल रिवॉल्यूशन को फॉसिल फ्यूल से ऊर्जा दी थी फॉसिल फ्यूल्स के उपयोग से कई देश तो समृद्ध हुए किंतु हमारी धरती हमारा पर्यावरण निर्धन हो गए फॉसिल फ्यूल्स की होड ने जियो तनाव भी खड़े किए 
लेकिन आज टेक्नोलॉजी ने हमें एक बेहतरीन विकल्प दिया है एक्सेंसीज हमारे यहां हजारों वर्ष पूर्व 